that grape holds all that ultraviolet light, and when you consume it, it releases light. You're starting to convince me wine might actually be healthy. <laughs> I know we're only supposed to be telling people that you're reducing your harm, but it actually sounds like a pretty cool right. uh, it is. thing. I mean, it has so survived thousands of years. We are in Clearwater tonight. I'm Allison Morrow. Hi, I'm Allison Morrow. I'm Allison Morrow, and I've gone to a lot of places. On St. Pete Beach, Allison Morrow. And now with my former Force Recon Marine husband, I'm going off grid ish. All right, so this is an exciting episode of Trailer Talk because it is the first time in the actual Airstream that we're going to be doing these interviews, which hopefully will become a studio we can take around the country. I'd say the world, but it'd be hard to take this across the ocean. Uh, and I'm very, very excited that our first time doing Trailer Talk, see, hat, uh, in the Airstream is Dr. Dave Romali of Seattle Natural Health because he is here to christen this trailer with some awesome wine. So Dave, we're talking wine tonight. Yes. Because sometimes wine can be scary when you see headlines that say, we're gonna get cancer, we're all gonna die if we drink wine. And you are a naturopathic physician, right? Yes. Tell us a little bit more about your credentials first so that people know you're not just a wine peddler or something <laughs> posing as a doctor. Like, what, what gives you the right to talk about health? Right, right. All right, well, I'm a naturopath and a chiropractor. Been in practice for 25 years. Um, definitely looking at nutritional value of foods and seeing how food can change people's health, give them more energy, and just feel a lot better. And so I found that wine can actually help people. It's not that I necessarily advocate that everybody drink wine. If you're not drinking it, you don't necessarily need to do it. But if you're going to drink wine, I always try to educate people on the right wine to drink and how it can help them. Okay. And I should add that uh, just like wine, the ambiance is calming us right now because it's raining, of course. And we're in a tin can, so you can kind of hear it. But we're just going to hope everyone just enjoys the trailer talk, listening to the the peaceful rain and we're gonna pop a, open a bottle. And so, after all, it is Seattle. It so is Seattle, but in I June. promise people that in summertime it doesn't rain and it's proving me wrong. Oh well, <laughs> not till July 4th, that's what everybody says. Yeah. So all right, so these are the three bottles you brought. First, why don't we just crack open this one so that we're like really professional, but tell me about this bottle. What okay. makes it special? Well, let me tell you about this one and kind of like all three of these that actually are from Argentina. Mm -hmm. It's from the Mendoza region. And these three specifically are from a subregion of Mendoza region, which is called Salta. And Salta means high or elevated in Spanish. Why is some wine not maybe green? Okay. Like maybe we could start there. Like, okay. okay, so when we do read these headlines, it not, may not necessarily be scare attacks. There may be actually something bad in wine. So, so if we're gonna talk about wine and the potential damaging effects it can have, what are those? Okay, so basically I would just say it's mostly to do with the alcohol content mm -hmm. of, of any, any you know alcoholic beverage right so the alcohol part can actually create some liver problems um, it can create some brain damage if you're drinking too much of it um, i think most of the studies show like light to moderate drinking is fine and can have some health benefits specifically with wine almost all the studies have been done on red wine part of the problem when they do those studies is what wine are they actually studying are they studying an organic wine grown at 5,000 feet from argentina are they growing are they studying a wine grown on really poor soil in rain somewhere in California with lots of pesticides and Roundup Ready. Yeah. So you're looking at two different, totally different wines, the nutritional value, the water, everything that goes into that wine is what makes the difference. First, what does alcohol itself, separate from all those other factors, um, what are the negative effects that just alcohol itself can have if you drink too much of it? Well, if you drink too much, you can actually uh, create problems with your liver because your liver has to detoxify it. So it can lead to what's called fatty liver disease. Um, also to the brain, it can start killing some neurons. It also severely dehydrates your body. Okay, but there are still benefits if you drink in moderation then, is that what we're saying? I would say that in small, in small amounts alcohol, I wouldn't necessarily call it healthy, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't wanna get in trouble, but I would say that in small amounts, it's relaxing for some people, mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily bad. Typically, most of the studies have been when people are binge drinking or drinking way too much. Mm -hmm. But probably if you're going to have a drink and have some food along with it at the same time, it's not a big deal. Okay. So we don't want to just tell people that like you should add this as a supplement to your diet necessarily. Right. That's like, what I want to make really clear. I am not advocating that anybody drinks alcohol. I, okay. I'm not advocating that they do or don't. I'm just saying if you're going to drink alcohol, let's find some ways to do it. And if you really want to drink some okay. alcohol that has a lot of health benefits, 
That's where we're going to focus on these red wines. Okay. All right. So uh, this is from the Salta region of Argentina. Did you already say why that is so No, this is okay. like the whole, this is the whole crucial point of this. Yes. So I'm going to kind of choose these particular wines and maybe compare them to maybe like uh, California or maybe some wines grown in Yakima, not to diss those areas, but I want to describe some of the differences. So the basic thing is most of the Argentinian wines, especially the Malbecs, are grown at either 3,000 feet or higher. Some even go up to 9,000 feet. The crucial difference between those and wines in California or Spain or somewhere else is at that elevation, what happens is the ultraviolet light from the sun, especially about 5,000 feet and above, is much more intense. So here's the cool thing about red wine. When that ultraviolet light hits the skin of the grape, that skin just like sucks in that ultraviolet light. So at that, you're, if we want to get a little technical, that's actually 312 nanometers of light. Okay, it's getting really geeky, all right? <laughs> but you're getting this ultraviolet light coming in, hitting the grape skin. And then what that grape skin is, especially with Malbecs, they have a really, you can tell you get excited. Okay, yes. they, they have a thick go, skin. Go, Dave, go. I'm going to go on, but they got a thick skin. And he's skin. totally sober. We should yeah. have said that. He hasn't had any right. yet. I haven't had any. Just came straight from yeah. work. <laughs> Doesn't mean I was sober. No, I'm just That's kidding. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so the grape skin is nice and thick. And then when that ultraviolet light hit it, it absorbs all that energy. The other aspect from Argentina, since it's at five or 6,000 feet, they're not getting it from a river. They're getting it from glacier runoff. So they're not oh, sucking wow. it from the Sacramento River or some mm -hmm. aquifer way down below the ground in, in Napa Valley or somewhere. They're getting this wonderful water. And so that water has a whole different, uh, I actually call it, it's actually, it's called an energetic potential to that water. So they're not only getting all this wonderful sun, what they're also doing is getting incredible water. And since it's so high, it's also not very humid, it's actually quite dry. And because it's so dry up there, you'd get less bugs, less fungi, all these other things. And so when you're in a dry climate like that, the grapes get under stress. So you got this wonderful water, you got this ultraviolet light beating down on the grape, and then you got some stress because of the, of the dryness up there. And so what happens is when that grape is under stress, it starts producing a lot of what are called phenols or polyphenols. So the most common one that people have probably heard of is called resveratrol. Mm -hmm. So that's, you see that people take resveratrol supplements, things like that. But here's the thing about when you try to find resveratrol in any kind of fruit, it needs stress. When it first came out, they went to all these grape you know, wineries and they said, hey, let's get some resveratrol. They could not find it in the grapes. And they kind of like, well, why not? They finally figured out is that because the plant has to be under stress. So again, when we look at a place like in Argentina at five or 6,000 feet, those grapes are under a lot of stress with that ultraviolet light. So when they're under stress, they release all these just like cool chemicals. I mean, there's really all sorts of names for them. There's probably 20 different names. One of them actually is, produces the antibiotic against insects. And so when you produce that antibiotic, when humans take it, it has a natural like antimicrobial effect against pathogens that we don't want in our gut. Interesting. Now, it's not like a true antibiotic that we would think from like a pharmaceutical mm -hmm. point of view. And then when it has all the resveratrol in it, um, that resveratrol acts as a great antioxidant to our body. And here's the cool thing about resveratrol. I, I get really excited about this. You're going to find these wines is resveratrol is called a, a fluorophore. So we're going to get a little technical here again. A fluorophore, <laughs> I might, it was boring, but a fluorophore basically is like a protein that absorbs light. So they know in these wines that if you actually drink it, you can use what's called curing photography. When people drink it, you can actually see light being emitted from that person. Wow. Because that grape holds all that ultraviolet light. And when you consume it, it releases light. You're starting to convince me wine might actually be healthy. <laughs> I know we're only supposed to be telling people that you're reducing your harm, but it actually sounds like a pretty cool right. uh, it is. thing. I mean, it has so, survived thousands of years, really. It has, yeah. And it's, yeah, I didn't mention it's actually fermented also. Um, so under that fermentation process, it actually releases a lot of those other good chemicals that you just wouldn't get from just drinking grape juice, right? So that's why sometimes they find you don't get the health benefits from grape juice because under the fermentation process, it releases a lot of other compounds and um, other health ingredients that our body needs. All right, so I'm curious about um, sulfites because I see that on the label a lot and I've read different material on the preservative, right, to keep it tasting right, good. Right. How does that affect us or does it? Uh, in some people it affects them. I think the sulfites aren't that bad. It's gonna, like they always say, it naturally occurs in the wine anyway. I think for the amount that they put in there, now it doesn't say 
they're not actually legally bound to say how much they put in there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many sulfites is in you know, a bottle of wine. If you notice, they'll say none of these have added sulfites. Yeah, you're right. Because, because of the way, well, I could be wrong. I don't think, I didn't ever see it. I don't see it, no. Yeah, they don't add sulfites because, um, again, at that, at that altitude. Oh, wait, so is it, yeah, it just says contain sulfites, because, but they say like, it's naturally occurring. Right, because it's naturally occurring. Right. Because you're going to get some sulfur from the, right. from, the, uh, from the grape skins. Okay. So that's why you're going to But you're saying it. why don't they use it, you think? Um, uh, well, I don't think they're going to have to add it because sulfites act as a preservative. But right. since these are fermented and they weren't, the grapes under a lot of stress, I think the antioxidant ability in that isn't going to make the wine go bad, which you'd find with the cheap wine. I so see. cheap wine isn't properly fermented. It's, it doesn't really have the stress under when it was growing. So then you get a wine that just doesn't have that kind of vibrancy. Okay, so when we talk about antioxidants related to wine and antioxidants, I don't know, I always associate that with um, keeping you from getting cancer. Is that the right correlation? I mean, does it, do those two go together? Or what is an antioxidant, yeah. I guess? Maybe that's the best way to ask it. Yeah. What's an antioxidant? So to back up, an oxidant would be even when we breathe and we breathe oxygen, our body actually produces oxidants. So they're they're called like free radicals. So mm -hmm. they're searching around. When you have this, they're searching around for another molecule atom where they can grab what's called an electron and take it. But when they do that, it creates damage to the cells. So it's happening to us all the time. It, I mean, it ha you want that to actually happen to a certain extent. So when you take an antioxidant, it's a way of quenching that uh, that whole. Uh, it, what it's doing is actually donating an electron. You get exactly that's uh -huh. what an antioxidant is donating. That's why people take vitamin C. Okay. Well, the reason why you take vitamin C is it's just donating an electron. It's actually quenching that whole process. Mm -hmm. So that's when you look at these wines and you see it's an antioxidant. It contains a lot more of what are called these electrons. So it brings down that antioxidant load. What happens in the reverse? What are the health effects, the negative health effects, if you don't have that? So if you don't have the antioxidants, mm -hmm. um, you end up by, uh, I would say you're gonna end up by getting uh, aging prematurely. Um, you'll have more problems with, uh, with your brain, with your heart, pretty much with any organ in your body, you're gonna start getting an inflammatory response in your body. And that's where the antioxidants come and they will quench that. Okay. Anything else about uh, these particular bottles here that we have not talked about? Nope. No. They're all just, like I said, grown at a high elevation. And again, I mentioned that at that high elevation, you get less bugs. So Argentina was listed as one of the top countries as well as Chile uh, for using the least amount of pesticides. Because at an altitude, you don't need a lot of that. Right. So you may not see organic on there, but they just, just by nature, they don't have to use that many pesticides. And interestingly, not too long ago, I believe, there was an article that came out that lots of other you know organizations then covered which was about uh still finding glyphosate like, residue in organically labeled wine because it's kind of all over the place in the united states and so even if you're buying organic wine you might still get roundup residue in it exactly um i know on some of the organic wines that i looked at they had a very very small amount mm -hmm. um but yeah they did find it on some of the ones some of them were very high i know they did a study of 10 different wineries um i would say you know, for California and probably for Washington, um, there are more humid areas where the wine grows. It doesn't get as cold as it would, like let's just say in Argentina. And so it's going to be more humid. And the more humid it is, the more, you know, like fungi you have, the more insects, mm -hmm. the more of everything. So the more pesticides they need. So it's just not glyphosate, although that's the main one going right. on there. Um, but there's also just other pesticides and other herbicides and fungicides they use that's going to show up in the wine. And how does that stuff affect us? It, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to be drinking it, but at the same time, it's like it's in all of our conventional vegetables mm -hmm. and food and everything else. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if wine contains any more of it than we would find any conventional food. Um, that's a whole other discussion. But, yeah. you know, when you're talking about the, the glyphosate, I think it has a lot of issues to do with, um, with uh, fertility problems. It also has to do with any of your offspring where you could start seeing some genetic anomalies with that as well. Now, I know enough to make me dangerous when it comes to your lecture on light, but, and you'd sort of referenced it before, but you uh, told your patients once when I was there uh, that you 
recognize or the bacteria i guess in your system recognizes the light in what you're eating from the region that it was grown and so that's why you tell people to eat locally uh as much as possible with sort of the natural cadence of the seasons and everything so how does that you know how do we talk about getting wine from argentina when we're living here in seattle and how is that connected and could you just kind of i know i probably butchered it but no 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 no, no, no you got it whole, right the basics of the light conversation and why the light of your where your food was grown matters to your health and how that's connected to this right so uh two things one is the microbiome or the bacteria in our gut as I mentioned, we were at that farmer's market tour that the, your bacteria emit light 5,000 times more than like a human cell. Any cell in our body, the bacteria emit 5,000 times more light. So there's been some great physicists who have determined that every cell in our body emits light. That's how energy, energy is light. And so the, our gut actually emit all this light. They did a recent study on people who were drinking red wine and they actually found that it increased beneficial gut bacteria. And so the way that I think to look at that is because that wine is absorbing some of that light. And that would be true even for in California. I'm not trying to say all wines are bad, but I'm saying they're all grapes are going to absorb some of that ultraviolet light from the sun, um, as any plant would. And when you're drinking that, it's emitting that light to the bacteria. That bacteria take up that light. And I think that's why you see a change in gut bacteria with even some wines and how that's changing it. Mm -hmm. um, and how that gets back to, um, our, obviously this isn't, a local wine, right? It's grown in Argentina. Right. But um, especially with these wines, I really like to drink it during the winter because it holds that ultraviolet light, which we just can't get in Seattle. So these are also great winter wines when we're not getting a lot of light. Okay. Um, but you can have it any time, which we'll yeah. do tonight. <laughs> yeah. In fact, let's crack it open. I'm going to let you do the honors. All right. And I'm going to get a close-up shot of you since I both do my own camera work and the interviewing. <laughs> <laughs> so I can twist off the cap? Yep. Okay. There we go. Smells great. Nice cap. So go ahead and pour us a, a yep, glass. Go All for right. it. Um. Oh, I can see that light just being emitted right now. <laughs> it's kind of blinding. So cheers, Dave. All right, cheers. How, so what am I going to taste in this? I'm drinking out of a jelly jar and... <laughs> And I have a bullet. <laughs> Dave's a drinking out a bullet. Yeah. These are wine wine uh, cocktail glasses that we got for our wedding, which uh, Lynn was a sniper in the Marine Corps. So yeah, but I think <laughs> it's good. They are literally I think it's shot great. glasses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Lynn tried to tell us what the round was, but I still it was a three hundred eight. Three hundred eight. Yeah, See, I don't even know. I'm surprised it didn't go all the way through the glass. I don't know if you get the same smell as you have a fancy glass, but. We're sitting so, in a trailer uh, right now, so no one. And this is great. Yeah, no, yeah, it's very appropriate. <laughs> there's no. Should pretense. we talk about the, the, the cost of the wine? Oh yeah, I'd so, love to do so that. So I just yeah. want to bring it because it's so like wow, yeah. like you're gonna have mm -hmm. to spend a fortune. I do not get any money from these. This is not an advertisement. Right. You can go to TotalWineWine.com anywhere. PC. I'm not making any advertisements. I just wanted to just show you a few of them, just so you get like some idea. Yeah. This is called Amalaya. It's about eleven dollars. Cheap. I just got on wine.com, but yeah. you can find it some other places. It's about $11, maybe $13 with tax and everything else. That's that's your so, typical, I would say, like lower, nicer middle, middle class. Yeah, yeah, Right, exactly, right, right. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. not two buck chuck, but yeah. you know, hey. No. Okay. And then this is one that's grown at a higher elevation. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little nicer. This is about $16, $17. Okay. So, so whenever I get a few of these, and this, of course, is my favorite because it's called Don David. Yeah, named okay. after no, you. Got, of course, it's a reserve. Um, and again, all these are growing right around six, uh, you know, five to seven thousand feet, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. And this is about probably like seventeen dollars. Yep. And so it's kind of tricky ordering these correctly because oh, yes. I yeah, did yeah, my yeah. first order, and on accident they all came white. Yes. Oh well. They're still grown at a high elevation. Yeah. They still got it, but it so was not. So just double check that the wine you're ordering is in fact red, if that's what you really want. I'm curious what you think though about the white wine. I mean, does it offer the same, you know, benefits, I guess, that we talked about the red or, it's, or not. So I still think it does. Um, again, partly because the water that's being used up there, again, is around six, nine, you know, some of that water is coming from 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. It's just straight off runoff from glaciers. So really what makes that wine too is the water. So when you're getting water at that elevation, it actually, like I said, has a much higher electric charge on it. So when you're drinking that, that grape was actually made from that water. And I think that's a lot of what's in the wine too. So I think you're getting the benefit of that. Um, you're still getting some of the benefit of the stress that that plant had to go through or that grape 
you just don't get a lot of the resveratrol and you probably don't capture as much light mm -hmm. um, in that wine as you would a red wine. Okay, well I will make sure that I put the links to these wines in the description of the YouTube video so people can click on them. So in my book, I give it, it's called Perpetual Energy. Perpetual, Perpetual Energy, energy. But no you, but you plug, go, yeah, no plug. plug. But you gotta go to the section on food because this is the exact same thing. I give an example mm -hmm. of, do you wanna eat a couch potato broccoli or do you want a broccoli that's been working out, lifting weights and running? Right. That's how it's gonna affect your body. Because we become so, what we eat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you have a broccoli that's grown with a bunch of water. It's, you know, it has fungicides, pesticides. There's no, there's no threat. It, it, plant just sits there and God just sits on its couch and this mm -hmm. is great. Mm -hmm. Now take a broccoli that has light on it all day. It's organic soil, so there's all sorts of bugs and microbes. There's plants, and there's insects flying around. So that broccoli puts out all of these chemicals to protect itself. So when I go pick kale in our yard, I don't look for the nice plant. I look for some that have little bugs that have been crawling on because that plant is going like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna release all these chemicals to defend that ant or that insect off. But that's what humans need. When we eat that plant, we're absorbing all those chemicals and that, that information in that plant. That's what I wanted to say. Light is information and go. plants are information. Uh -huh. So that's when we're eating that plant and we're absorbing all that even though it might have a higher nutritional content, it's that information that's in that broccoli or that plant that's communicating to our genes and saying, well, let's turn off those genes that promote cancer, autoimmune disease, and let's turn on those genes that promote health. And that's information, not necessarily just vitamins or minerals. I had uh, Dr. Zach Bush w is on the channel. We have a video with him and- I saw that. Yep. It was excellent. And he's an MD, um, but he looks into this kind of stuff a lot too, which I don't think is necessarily par for the course for MD training all the time. I mean, my, both my parents are MDs and they really didn't learn a whole lot about this kind of stuff at all in their training. Um, but he's looked into it a lot because he really has, he was a cancer researcher and really has found um, this to be central to health. Um, and what I thought was interesting, what he said is that like, he sees the brain as a central processing unit, but not something that's necessarily coming up with its own thoughts. And he's really big on understanding how we're taking information and, um, uh, and and just all kinds of stuff from our environment, whether it's by food or what we're looking at or what we're breathing. And so to really think about the inputs, I guess, and, and often stuff we totally overlook. I mean, it's funny, you know, we're about to go into a presidential election season. I'm a journalist. We're all like, oh, God, you know, because this is when the world's going to go insane. Because right, right, right. everybody puts so much pressure on, like, certain days and certain things. And a lot of times we overlook just the things, the little things that we do all the time. And that, that actually, you know, separate from politics, but just our, our food, like, has a big impact over the course of 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Maybe if you had one bad glass of wine your whole life, big deal but if right. you're drinking a couple glasses a week then you know over 30 years who knows and so i guess i'm curious like what do you think about uh telling people and how do you encourage them to think about that kind of stuff because uh, obviously i'm sure when people come see you they're already probably interested in it to begin with but you know this channel is all about trying to get people uh, inspired and encouraged and to, to be able to tell their friends. And so how do you tell people? I, I tell them one step at a time. So just do one thing. It doesn't matter what it is. It might be maybe you eat fast food four times a week. I said, well, why don't you go to Chipotle one of those times and cut back on some of your fast food? Or if you go to the grocery store, maybe try buying organic or if you don't exercise, just go walk around the block a few times. Just pick one thing and don't make it overwhelming. Just keep it simple. Just say this week, I wanna try one new thing that may only just take five or 10 minutes of my time, but just implement that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those little things, like he was saying, can really like have a profound influence because now all of a sudden, hey, I start feeling a little bit better. I can start thinking a little bit better. So maybe I'll try doing this next thing and this next thing. I just say, not, you know, don't get overwhelmed. There's so much information out there. It's like, just kind of pick one thing and start with there. My passion is the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, go to the, you just go to the farmer's market on a Saturday. I know some places don't have them, but you know, if you can find some place, especially during the summer, don't spend a ton of money. You don't have to just go and just pick a couple things and enjoy it. Just look at the produce, find something that you relate to that you like and buy it and then eat it during the week. And I think I've seen that just change over time. People go like, I did some of these tours like 10, 12 years ago, even longer than that. 
And I still see some of people and they said, you know what, I go to the farmer's more often, you go to the farmer's market more often, I buy more organic produce. I've actually started walking, started doing some of these things and it just started with one step. Mm -hmm. So does food talk to us? Absolutely. It does. It does. It's, it's interesting. information, man. It's, it's information. So what's so funny is before I met Lynn, I was hiking. This is several years ago. And I met a naturopath on my hike. I think he had a thing for me, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> who, who wouldn't? Um, and the, But the one thing I remember before I was really down the rabbit hole on food and stuff, he goes, plants talk to me. And I said, what do you mean they talk to me? And he, you mean like you just get a sense of, he goes, no, they actually talk to me. I'm curious, you know, when, when someone says like, you know, that our environment is really literally communicating with us. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, is it is it just our cells are constantly communicating with, in a way that like our brains, like the way that we're cognitively aware of, there's this whole world around us that right. we're just totally going through life completely oblivious of, but perhaps is the very building blocks of our existence. Right. Two things. One, they've already done, they already know that plants talk to each other. Okay, so he wasn't okay. crazy. No, there's not crazy. And, you know, <laughs> well, we could say it on a spiritual energetic level, but they actually communicate through fungi in the ground. Mm -hmm. The fungi are down there and they're actually setting up these mycelium. And so it's like kind of like the roots of the, of the mushrooms of the fungi. And those trees will use that. And they can look at, they've done this in Africa, you could look like at a zebra eating a, a certain tree. And they can measure almost instantaneously, say a mile away, that tree is already secreting the chemicals it needs to keep that zebra away. It's like a mile away. Wow. And so you see that in forest and everything else. So you can call it woo, whatever you want, but I'm just saying from a very scientific point of view, yeah. trees are communicating with each other. And on the other thing, I, this is gonna be very scientific. Go to, the, go to Ikea, look at their YouTube video on putting up two plants. They said, here's one plant where the kids come in and they say, plant, you suck. I think you're a piece of crap. I hate you, blah, blah, blah. The other plant, they said, I love you. And they did this for 30 days. It's a great, we've done this at our house numerous Incredible. times, numerous times, like setting up these experiments. And it is really cool to do that in your own house. I tell people, I'm go put to. up two plants and, and you will talk to them. And they show, it's, it's so cool. You got to look at this video. It shows the one plant that said, when humans said, I love you, the plant is just flourishing. The one says, I hate you. The plant's just literally dying. And this is at Ikea, right? So it's a controlled experiment. They're just mm -hmm. doing this. And so, you know, there's this interaction. And we all think it's woo-woo, but I think on a very, very scientific level, you are exchanging light. You are exchanging energy, and that energy is actually measured in light. And so those plants are picking that up. I love you. I love you so much. <laughs> yeah, well, so the wine saying, you're very welcome. Thank you, the wine. The fact that you're drinking this means that I can survive in the hills of Argentina, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm supporting it, you know? Yeah. But it is fascinating because if you think about all the messages we tell ourselves, too, every day, and uh, our own, you know, oh, Allison, you're... A mis you made a mistake you you know you're this you're that and right. and how over time how that affects us i mean you can all, i can i can see how it, it that that it affects things all around us in a communication way that i don't know maybe 20 the 100 years from now we'll start to understand better i will say i always think it's interesting because i think about this when i'm talking to uh, vegans and vegetarians i'm always thinking well what happens if one day we find out that lettuce really is not liking it when you chop right. it down then where are we going to eat but anyway yeah. i i really think that's just so cool um what we're starting to learn about this because at the end of the day i really do believe that our food is one of the central places where we're going to make a big difference on the environment and in human health. And that's why I've chosen to focus a lot of this channel on that and why I wanted to move into an Airstream and grow my own food and start a homestead because it's like, I want to live it before I start just telling everybody else, hey, let's go do it. I want to model it with my life. But really because I believe that like, if that's the one thing we could try to tackle right now, that we could make a really big difference because it's something we all have to do. And right. there's all these changes that we could make immediately. Um, if you can't go buy uh, a Prius or whatever, you know, then um, maybe you can just buy a different kind of wine and and a different kind of steak or whatever it is and just start looking at these little items that make a big difference so not Absolutely. that i don't even know if you drive an electric car i don't i don't know i've never driven one you like driving an electric i car? do i okay. love it so there you go i don't know if it's saving the planet or not but i like driving one but so. don't drink and drive <laughs>
whether it's electric or not. That's right. Hey, yeah. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Yes. I thoroughly Again, enjoyed it. Dr. Dave Romelli at Seattle Natural Health. If you're in Seattle, you got to go check him out and um, tell him you love him if you see him. And yeah, bring a bottle of wine. And bring a bottle of wine because it'll, <laughs> it'll make his day. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.